Hola, soy Cristina Domenech, creadora de Guru Cards Yoga for Kids, la baraja de cartas de yoga para toda la familia, inspirada en las ilustraciones de los textos antiguos de la filosofía del yoga. Agradezco a la Embajada de India esta oportunidad que me da para presentaros la baraja dentro del marco del Día Internacional del Yoga. Pero antes, me gustaría poder compartir con todos vosotros la entrevista que tuve el placer de hacer a Kausto de Sikachar, el nieto de Krishna Macharya, el gran maestro del yoga Krishna Macharya. Kausto en este momento es uno de los grandes exponentes que tenemos en el mundo del yoga y inspirado por su abuelo y por su padre, es uno de los grandes terapeutas del Vini Yoga o el yoga personalizado o individualizado. Hablamos en esta entrevista de la importancia de transmitir el yoga a las nuevas generaciones en Occidente. Um, yoga is a very, very old and wonderful system that has been the gift of uh, India to humanity for at least 3,000 years now, maybe more. And uh, the beauty of uh, yoga is that it is a very, very uh, holistic system that is not just looking at our existence in the human form as a physical, biological, or a chemical structure, but also as an energetic structure we all have not the same kind of energy. Some of us have more energy. Some of us have less energy. Some of us have more energy in the certain seasons, in certain times of the day. Some others have a different energy in different times of the day, different seasons. So we are also made up of an energetic dimension. We are also made up of an intellectual dimension. How our mind functions is also very different, very unique. Then we also have a dimension of uh, our personality, our characters, our traits that define each person. Some people are more extroverted, some people are more introverted, some people talk very straightforward, some people talk a little bit roundabout, etc. Some people see the things in the world as positive, some people see the things in the world with pessimistic eyes. So our personality is also quite unique and that is also part of our system as well as our emotional dimensions or spiritual dimensions, as we can call a much more <clears throat> deeper dimension that we are also spiritual beings, not just biological. So yoga looks at all of these constructs as part of the human system and gives us tools and techniques to influence these different dimensions in appropriate and positive manners so that we achieve holistic health. There's no point in having a physically fit body if our emotions or mind is not good. There is also not a good idea if we just have an emotion and mind as good, but not a physical body as healthy. So yoga looks at all of these different dimensions, accepts them as essential parts of our human structure, human existence, and understands this and therefore gives us technology to access this. It's quite different from how yoga is understood in modern times, especially in the Western country as more like a gymnastic physical kind of exercise because that is a very small part of yoga. Yoga is much, much bigger and that is why I always love to understand it as a holistic health system that is a great gift for humanity, especially when you look at the current times now, uh, we are living in a very challenging pandemic time. It's not just physical dimension that is getting affected. Many people have uh, their mental uh, dimensions, emotional dimensions as well being challenged, their energetic dimensions being channel challenged. And so yoga can be a very good solution for such people in all of these dimensions. So that is how yoga is a, a holistic uh, system of well-being and health. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's also accessible for everybody. 
irrespective of the age or gender or physical or emotional capacity. We can always adapt and modify yoga to suit the individual because the tool basket of yoga is very big, not limited to certain set of physical positions. This is something that we all have to understand. Um, I think this is very, very essential. <clears throat> and uh, the way uh, yoga and uh, Ayurveda and other traditional systems, like including traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Korean medicine, etc. When they look at the concept of health or therapy, they are not only looking at treatment or cure, they are actually propagating first what is called prevention. So when we start to teach yoga techniques, yoga practices to children from a very young age, not just asana practices, but also introducing to them the philosophical aspects of yoga, which I am doing together with one of my students in Estonia, where we are teaching yoga sutra philosophy to young kids of seven, eight years old. <clears throat> so when we do that, they, are, they start becoming uh, individuals with a little bit of better knowledge or let's say different knowledge than what they are conventionally taught like mathematics or biology or chemistry or whatever. Apart from that, they have a slightly different view which will help them to make certain choices. For example, some of these kids who we are teaching of their own, they have said that they don't want to uh, eat uh, meat products so much because they want to resonate with the concept of ahimsa, for example. On their own, they some of them have told us that they don't want to drink Coca-Cola or things like that because they feel that that is not necessarily healthy. And these are choices that these young individuals are making. And that is what adults underestimate. Adults underestimate the wisdom that children can have. So when we can give them a platform of education of uh, a higher thinking, I want to call it not necessarily higher education, but of a elevated thinking, which can elevate their consciousness and awareness there is a lot of prevention that can happen. So many physical as well as mental and emotional uh, capacities uh, uh, are grown and they don't suffer as much. I mean, last month I've had this conversation with these kids and they were asking me to talk about grief because one of the girls, uh, her family member passed away. So she wanted to talk about grief. Uh, and so by talking about grief uh, to these kids, a few weeks later, they actually start to integrate some of these concepts into their life and they feel better rather than feel depressed because somebody has passed away at a very young age. And that could be very traumatic for the young kids. So yoga therapy is having a part of preventative aspect as well. And of course, yoga therapy also has maintenance and how do you say palliative care or curative care, which also can be offered. But that's the beauty of yoga is that it can play a role in all three stages of illness prevention. But if you can't prevent it happens, okay, palliative care. And even if that is not possible, at least managing life with a better quality with the illness all are possible and i think that is where uh, humanity is realizing this more and more about yoga and yoga therapy that it's not limited but it has a much larger scope of practice um, we have our dialogues and uh, i think there are areas where 
there is somehow some kind of challenges and these are areas like I explained to you earlier already, challenges surrounding the intangible principles. See, a lot of the modern yoga practitioners, yoga schools around the world want to understand yoga through Western medicine, like the bones and the joints and the muscles and the tissues and things like that. But that's really a stupid way to understand because when yoga was presented many, many years ago, yoga, the modern medicine did not even exist anywhere in the world. So obviously the tools of yoga are not based on the way modern science understands the body. So this is what I argue or dialogue with the students from around the world and slowly help them to realize that yoga is based on subtle principles like prana, like the nadis, the energy channels, etc., the digestive fire, the metabolic fire called agni, etc., and ask them to become more educated about this so that they can teach yoga in a more appropriate and consistent manner. See, it's like every discipline or philosophy is like a language. Now, I cannot interpret Spanish through German. I cannot interpret German through Spanish. It's two different groups of languages. They don't share the same philosophy, the same origins or roots. Perhaps there is more closeness between Italian and Spanish but not Spanish and German or Spanish and Latvian. It's completely different. So if you have to really understand a system, the same thing you have to do, you have to go back to its origins and understand it from its traditional perspective. Otherwise it will only give a, a partial idea and sometimes even an incorrect idea. And this is one area where we have a conversation between the oriental approach of yoga and the Western or modern approach of yoga. Another aspect where the concept of dialogue between yoga and Western culture is about the philosophical differences. Uh, modern science, for example, when you take modern science, it is mostly materialistic, where you have to have experimental validation, scientific proof, where you can prove something with a measurement using a machine. But in yoga, it's not just that, there is also intangible dimensions that is not measurable through instruments like prana, for example. It's impossible to measure prana with a machine, at least until now. So this is also another dimension where yoga is looking at, a traditional yoga is looking at yoga in a more spiritual way, whereas modern yoga is looking yoga in a more materialistic way. And that's a very big difference because they are looking, materialism is one direction, spirituality is another direction and they need to understand that yoga cannot be understood from a material point of view because it is a spiritual tradition. You cannot deny the spiritual role of yoga. And this is two areas where there is a great uh, debates and arguments that we have. And I think it's, I'm very optimistic because yoga is very young in the Western world. It's only since um, 1893 that yoga came to the West, perhaps. And it's only since 1960s and 70s that yoga actually became popular. And it became very popular only in the 80s and 90s. So it's about 50, 60 years of tradition, which is very new, very young. So in another 30, 40 years, I'm quite optimistic that Western world will start opening the eyes to much more different dimensions of yoga. And as yoga teachers, 
like myself, I take this as a time of safeguarding the tradition till that time when people can understand it in a much more deeper capacity. So in a way, I feel like a, a temporary guardian of a tradition. Cuenta una leyenda india que el dios Shiva creó 8.400.000 posturas de yoga o asanas con el fin de representar a cada ser vivo de todo este universo. De esta forma podría el ser humano representar a cada manifestación y poderse fundir en cada uno de ellas. De esa forma todos podríamos llegar a ser todos. ¿Por qué no pensar que al fin y al cabo todos somos lo mismo? Y también llegar a ser, ¿por qué no? Una tortuga, un danzarín cósmico, un guerrero o un árbol. Guru Karts, la baraja de yoga para toda la familia, nace con la intención demostrar a los más pequeños lo que la filosofía milenaria del yoga puede aportarles, tanto a nivel mental como a nivel físico, a través de 41 asanas o posturas de yoga. De esta forma, a través del juego, el yoga les ayudará a enfocar su mente y a flexibilizar, además de fortalecer todo su cuerpo. Guru Cards Yoga for Kids está compuesta de 41 cartas. En cada una de ellas encontrarás una asana o una postura de yoga para que comiences en este fascinante mundo del yoga a partir de 4 años. El juego se divide en 14 posturas de descanso, 16 asanas de animales y 11 posturas que complementan el juego. En el reverso de cada carta encontrarás la explicación de cómo montar el asana sin hacerte daño. La baraja contiene tres líneas bien definidas, las posturas o asanas de descanso con las cenefas de flor de loto y cuyo color predominante es el azul, los asanas de animales enmarcadas en cenefas vegetales y cuyo color predominante es el verde, y las posturas que complementan la baraja cuyo marco es geométrico y sus colores principales son los naranjas y terracotas. En el reverso de cada baraja tienes el nombre del asana y cómo poder ejecutar de forma correcta sin que te hagas daño. El papel con el que se ha hecho Guru Yoga for Kids es 100% respetuoso con el medio ambiente, con certificación de la cuna a la cuna. Este papel es papel piedra. Bajo el precepto de Ajimsa, no se ha talado ni un solo árbol para confeccionarla. No se ha utilizado agua, ni PVC, ni cloro. 100% responsable con nuestro medio ambiente, con nuestro planeta. Las ilustraciones de cada carta de esta baraja están creadas por el pintor valenciano Luis Contreras Pardo. De hecho, las pinturas nos recuerdan ese sentir sacro y naif de las pinturas y las ilustraciones de los textos clásicos de la filosofía del yoga. Guru Kars quiere que seas tú el que cree las propias reglas de tu juego, pero solo basándote, eso sí, en una sola y fundamental. Cada vez que crees tu secuencia de yoga con las cartas e intercales las cartas de animales con las asanas complementarias entre una y otra, siempre, siempre tendrás que poner una postura de descanso, con el fin de que tu cuerpo se beneficie de la asana o de la postura que hayas ejecutado inicialmente. Si es la primera vez que entras en contacto con el yoga, Dentro de la baraja vas a encontrar varias opciones para adentrarte en este fascinante mundo y para que más adelante puedas ser tú junto con tu familia o con tus amigos quienes puedan crear las propias reglas de Guru Cards.
El yoga es un tesoro universal y un regalo para todos. Tonifica los músculos, los tejidos, ligamentos, articulaciones y nervios. Además, mantiene el buen funcionamiento de todos los sistemas de nuestro organismo. El cuerpo y la mente, tras su práctica, se ven en calma y con mayor equilibrio y mucho más enfocados. Recuerda que el yoga favorecerá su creatividad, su talento y su autocontrol a través del juego, dejando las tensiones emocionales o físicas que pueda acarrear el niño. El yoga es una maravillosa herramienta para aumentar la autoestima personal y el amor propio. Recuerda que con la compra de cada baraja se donará un euro a un proyecto local en India para la infancia y la educación. No tenemos todavía el destino al que llegará este dinero a finales de año. Por eso, si nos quieres echar un cable, si nos quieres echar una mano, puedes entrar en gurugats.es y mandarnos un mail con algún proyecto local que tengas en mente o que conozcas de primera persona. It's a very good way because when we used to teach, uh, uh, when we were taught yoga by our teachers when we were children, often there would be stories that were told about the asanas or about the names of the, the sages who are after whom the asanas are named and things like that. And of course, it was all orally transmitted. But the visual medium is quite strong for young children because young children learn by observation and visually they are much more observant. So I think this kind of inspirational cards which can teach yoga to them is an excellent way because they can not only look at a picture but they probably they can also read about a story or be told a story about that and that could make this kind of uh, interest in yoga more like a joyful experience rather than a very serious experience. Because if you think about it, when you are teaching children, we have to remember that we are not competing with other yoga schools to uh, get the attention of the children. We are competing with video games. We are competing with uh, smartphones. We are competing with the television, etc. So we need to create very intelligent ways to engage the interest of a child and uh, I think these are very good ways. What we do uh, with the Estonian kids I told you is we tell them the stories and we ask them to draw the drawings uh, and this is essentially what you are doing with this concept where you are giving some pictures around which a story is told around which the Uh, practice of yoga is introduced and it's a very remarkable idea and I think you should continue this and expand it to even more dimensions. Of course that is where the creativity of the teacher comes in and when you look at all the Vedic learning that we have when you look at the Upanishads or Uh, some of the classical texts of uh, yoga and other philosophies, they were all taught to young children. And so if you have to teach very high philosophy to a young child, it's not through very high philosophy, it is through some kind of playful stories. So the story would be told to somebody as a story to a child the child will grow up with that story. And like I said, these stories go deep into our subconscious. And later we learn that, oh, this is about life. For example, we have many stories about in the, in the Vedic tradition about the uh, demons fighting with the angels. We call it Asuras and Devas. And there is constantly fighting and things like that. Now, there are stories told about this in so many different ways, but when you grow up as an adult, you realize that these stories still have meaning because the demons and the angels 
or our good side and our bad side. It's not that one person is good and one person is bad, but within one person there is that conflict. Sometimes we want to do good, sometimes we want to do bad. This is part of our human nature. So the stories are are told in a playful manner to young children, so they remember. But they contain philosophical seeds that will be realized when a person becomes older. And that is the greatness of introducing deep philosophical teachings through playful methods, because they will be deeply embedded in the psyche of a child and they will grow with it, nurture it, and then they will realize the meaning of that.